yeah, our CNCs are going to go out. Whole thing with the CNCs go, going out is uh, I just don't have the work hasn't came up for them. You know, this one here we had where it was functional online. We just never actually used it. Um, and, and people will say, the one that I got from a man initially, and, and lots of there's been argument about, oh, CNC is the coming way. You've got to do everything by CNC. And I had a friend that had a bridge port that was a CNC machine, and he said he could put, you know, even putting a keyway in a piece of shaft is what he said. I could do it quicker in my CNC mill than I could on my manual. And I was kind of like, well, I doubt that, but maybe, you know? And, and I understood where he's at. It's a good situation. You're in a shop that is mostly CNC. That's what you're doing. You're doing hundreds of this part, thousands of that part, and one or two jobs come in that are within the range of the machine you're working on they are within that size range because the office already weeded out the piece that's 12 foot by 62 foot. It's within the size range of what you normally are working in. It's within the tools that you normally have on that machine. And so there's just one of them. They have you write a manual data input or a short program so that you can do that on the machine. It makes sense. And it's relatively quick on the machine with the tools you're already using, but the job was pre-chosen for that machine. There's so many variables in machining. To say that CNC is the rule or not the rule, it's very, very difficult. Now, let me go back for just a second to this one with the piece of shaft and you put a keyway in it. His specific job that this man had done was for a blower shaft, which is real common for home heating systems, and they're about two foot long. If we were doing a lot of stuff with this machine and we had all the tools in it, it would be a possibility, and it would have good value. I, I know shops that do that. When you have mostly a CNC shop, they have good value in running a few of the one-off parts through the machine because it keeps the guys on top of things. They're not just changing out 200 parts then while they're waiting for a new drawing to come in. It keeps them on top of making changes in the program so that they can do that one off. And if they're really good, they get relatively quick at it. But now, again, let's stop for a second. And I've, I've mentioned this to several people that I know that are strictly, it's got to be done on a CNC. Let's say our shaft that we're putting a keyway in is not two foot long. It's 10 foot long. Well, now what do we do? Do we do something illegal and bypass the switches for our doors so that we can work on a 10 foot long shaft inside of this CNC machine? Um, we could, but it's no longer quick then we'd think that a manual machine maybe is the answer. Or with our 10 foot long shaft, do we do another way like someone was talking about all the different jobs that they could do because of a $140,000 CNC machine they had. They were mentioning that on the comments. And in my dream shop, even if I don't have work for the CNC to justify the space, but in my dream shop, there's a center office building. The shop is 200 foot in all directions. So it's basically a 400 by 400 foot shop because I don't want to walk over 200 foot. That's, that's why it's my dream shop stops at that size. The crane runs around in a radial pattern. So we have some little corners that the crane won't get to, but the crane goes out 200 foot and runs around from the center office area on a beam. And in this shop, we have, in all areas, we have strictly manual machines and CNC both because they're both good. 
We have all the varieties of them. And the CNC's that we can't justify from our particular type of work that's in the shop, we still have them sitting there. And we have a dedicated CNC repairman, which is the thing that people don't talk about a lot with CNC's, is all of the time you take replacing batteries, bringing in the newest software, bringing things up to date, and making it usable. I would have all of that. Unfortunately, being in Fairbanks, Alaska, being actually the shop with the most variety and largest equipment that's available to use in Fairbanks area, I got to kind of do what makes sense and what pays for the heat, the lights, everything else. And I just don't have the work to justify for the CNC's or to justify a specific machine for each job. Uh, sometimes modify machines, so they'll work for the job. Um, another one back here, let's say uh, where I was talking about one job um, and I was mentioning the uh, lathe that was worn out. It was not here, this was in another shop. It was a lathe that was a little bigger swing than this lathe and I'd mentioned that it's the machinist's fault if he doesn't compensate for the flaws in the machine. And that's a given situation. A lot of people were saying, no, it's the, it's the shop owner's fault for not buying a better machine. It's easy to place blame at different places when you have this imaginary un, 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 unexpiring budget unlimited budget. I mean, it's great, you know? We had that old worn out machine that they bought for $1,000. That's what they had in the machine. Now it took up a space that was worth probably $5,000 a year at that time, that space. The job we did by mapping out and fighting with the inaccuracies of this machine, I think it paid us five or 10,000. So it was worth doing, it was part of the four or five jobs per year that that machine did. We could not justify in that space. I held no ill will towards the owners of that shop as far as that machine went for not buying a newer machine that would cost 150000 I thought it was great to have the old machine. I felt like I was doing good for them by going beyond the normal concept of it's a garbage machine, I'm just gonna turn out garbage work. That is a bad concept. If you're a machinist, you really should do whatever it takes with what you're given to do the best you can. Um, getting back to the general discussion of this is trying to be a final overview on my thoughts of CNC versus manual. Had a job we were running, we were using this lathe right here. I didn't yet have my other small lathe. And as a matter of fact, again, financially looking at it, why do I call a 20 inch lathe a small lathe? A lot of shops down in the States, you know, um, 16 inch is a more usable size lathe or 14 inch because you can do smaller jobs better. Most of our work is in the four inch diameter and up. That's where our work is. We do stuff on one inch shafts, we do stuff on quarter inch shafts, and it's a real pain in a 20 inch lathe. It really is. I have a couple of 10 EE Monarch 12 inch lathes. I can't justify bringing them in the shop. I used to have them in the shop when I had less other equipment, but they don't justify the space for the amount of work that's in this market. It comes back to economics. Now, what I was doing here, at one point I was running a job that I knew a turret lathe or a CNC lathe was good for. And it was a repeat job. I actually had hired somebody else to help me who had both manual and CNC experience. And I think I was running about 12 minutes per part making these pieces. At the same time, I already had purchased the CNC lathe that's on the end, at the end of the shop. We'll walk down in a second. I owned that lathe at the time, but it hadn't got here yet. It wasn't wired. 
I still had to make 50 of these to make this month's quota and keep the customer happy. So I was doing them about 12 pieces, 12 minutes per piece. Um, the man that was working with me that I was trying to get to help me a little bit, it was taking him about 25 minutes each to do these. Well, he hadn't done manual machining in a long time. I, I get that. The thing that was a little annoying to me was he kept complaining how this needs to be done on CNC, we should just quit doing this. It was what financially made sense at that point in time. And so we had to do this. Um, and we, I managed to get through it. We had some scrap parts, measured them after we're all done. We got done, we did it on the manual machine. It kept us going. Uh, the next order of those I think was for 300 of them. And by that time I had my CNC down here going. And, and this CNC down here, uh, seven axis CNC ran, did, did good for me. I think we were making the parts in around eight minutes each. And I know the same part, because I used to run turret lathes, I could have made in four minutes each on a turret lathe. Now you say, yes, and this is true. Um, I was imagining the perfect setup on the turret lathe where I didn't have those perfect particular tools for the CNC. The advantage to the CNC is it's quicker to go from that eight minutes on that particular part to eight minutes on another part, where with the turret lathe, instead of single point threading, we would have been, which still takes time on a CNC lathe, we would have been using um, <coughs> chasing heads, which I have, but I didn't bother to set them up for the, lathe, the turret, so the CNC. So I could have set the CNC up to be quicker, but I would have had more setup time. There's just a lot of variables is the point. It's not a, this is the way to do it. You can come up with a, this is the way to do it if we are um, extreme production, unlimited cost for setup, and we've had a few times to try it and find out what does and doesn't work. Another thing where one-offs are really, really better on a manual and, and open type lathe per se, you're getting these stringy chips coming off of your part. Just flat, you, you can't hardly get them to not be stringy. If you get that situation in the CNC, now we have, have a way to deal with it. We program it, take a little cut, stop, take a little cut, stop, take a little cut, stop, where you don't dare let those chips build up because they're gonna tear up pieces of the machine if they're heavy, heavy chips. They're going to cause real problems in a CNC. In the manual machine, if you ignore them for a while, they will build up around the part. You can stop, take a dike, and, and cut them off. That's short for diagonal cutter. Um, you can, you can cut, the ch cut the long stringy chips off. You have those options. Now, back to our scenario of the unlimited funds. Uh, we eventually get this to where we have ultimate production, and that's great if all we're doing is making the same or similar things and then when we're done with them, we throw them away because it's all funneled down to three big companies. And the, the whole world is trying to go that way, except it's probably 50 companies that are fighting for the work and three really big corporations that own some of them. And everything else should be thrown away. As long as we go to that mentality, then there's no other variables. We don't have to worry about other things because all we make is what the very select few chose is going to be made this week. All of the little startup shops, all of the little, they don't, they don't matter. I don't know if I like that whole concept running that. <laughs> That's a little more political. Um, yeah, but it's machine shop. Yeah, it is. Anyway, I mean, the general, um, yeah, high production, high, high production makes, uh, makes a reason why you do it a specific way. Otherwise, there are so many variables. And uh, another one with the horizontal mill. That was 
There was a program a long time ago, uh, and they still make stuff. I forget which it is. It's one of the, the popular going from a shape in a 3D drawing to a pattern, uh, to a, a program in a mill. And they were showing a three-axis CNC mill, and it pulled out of its caddy of tools that were readily already loaded, ready to go. It pulled out a half inch by six inch long, which is a little unique to have already sitting in your caddy, but you might. Anyway, pulled out this half by six inch, and they are showing how this program is making this bracket. Well, I saw this bracket that's being made with basically just two pieces of plate for a pin to come through and a couple of shapes in there. And I looked at that and I said, this is silly. I mean, we're using this end mill and it's an expensive end mill with custom offset and doing all of this. And they were bragging about how they had a part from the drawing kicked out in an hour and a half or something, you know? And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, if I took a horizontal mill, I put some big saw cutters on it, took one cut through that with some big cutters off my shelf, in 20 minutes, I'd have the same part made. But it also depends on what tooling you have. Those are not tools that everybody has laying on the shelf. Now, I explained that to a man that was working at a college teaching CNC, teaching the next generation. This was kind of when the, the push to, to really get rid of the manual machines was coming into play. And, and I learned manual machining at that same college years earlier. And things had changed, different people there. I was there to see what used machinery they might have for sale or know of in the area. And he was saying that, and I explained this to him, how this, I think it was Mastercam. If not, it was one like Mastercam. Anyway, how this program was just pushing you into this stupid little box of how you were gonna do things. And yes, the program could help you, but you still needed to know what was gonna be best for what you were doing. Uh, you know, as far as the manufacturing, you still had to have more production experience. It wasn't just that it was automatically, if you just let it automatically push you, it was gonna push you in the wrong way. His answer to this was, that I was looking at it wrong. That what needed to be done in this situation is, like I said, use it on a horizontal mill, but don't use it on the $2,000 at that time used horizontal mill that I was envisioning. No, his answer was buy a quarter of a million dollar five axis horizontal mill and feed it with these cutters so that it could do the job in 20 minutes while you watched it. Okay, again, if you have the unlimited funds and production ability and you're going to start out, this is a production part, but if it's a production part, why are we bragging about being able to do a quick prototype? Lots of different things here. Any which way that I say and speak about this, I'm just trying to be as broad as I can. I love CNC. They got good things about them. And I'm still looking at some different controllers for, I want to do a CNC um, hybrid machine with our hollow spindle. The hollow spindle is going to be in here. I have work that I have had to turn down because of not having the hollow spindle actually functional. When we have it functional, having the CNC addition on it for shapes will be an advantage because instead of just having a taper attachment, we'll be able to do some compound curves and some curves in there. And that will be an advantage. It doesn't have to be real fancy, but that will be an advantage. So one thing that I found that's really, really good with CNC's and is overlooked, even though managers do this, you, you get the program set up, you're making the part, and it is eight minutes per part. You can plan on that. It doesn't matter, somebody's got a cell phone they're looking at, there's other things, distractions, it's eight minutes. It might get disturbed if the man didn't get to take the parts out, if you didn't have a parts catcher. Um, you know, there's other things can happen, but you can pretty well plan on the eight minutes where when it's strictly a manual situation, it's hard to do that anymore. It was a little easier years ago when we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have the distractions we do. And I even thought because I I, I was in that mode when we, I used to work years ago, and especially we'd run turret lays. 
running turret lathes, parts, small parts that we would make uh, anywhere from 30 per hour of the average parts we were making up to 80 was was pretty normal for little nozzles, threaded adapters, uh, things. Anyway, little parts. Pistons is what we were making here at eight minutes each. They were uh, some pistons. But uh, anyway, and so with the cell phones and all that, um, there was a time when this first started into the cell phone on my employees and I had thought about being a no cell phones in the shop. Just no, no, because I had worked old school where we put our nose down and the only thing we saw was parts and oil smoke and you know, every little bit is for it. Well then, I'm in town, a new job comes in I knew that my employee has got a cell phone and did it, did it, did it, it. They're good too. There's a balance. So there is a balance in having the cell phones around. It does help. Uh, even though I was old school and I wanted just work, 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 work. Yeah. Isn't that what you think, Doggle? Work, 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 work. Anyway. <laughs> yes. He doesn't think work at all. He likes forklift rides. Work, work, work. Anyway, um, no, I, I see the advantage in it for communication between us, you know, and it, it helps a lot of times. Somebody tells me there's a customer here, there's something going on. Um, that communication is good. They can become distracting, they can become a problem. That's more of an individual thing with the employee and it's not so much getting rid of the phone as it is, um, is the employee using it for the advantage of the business or is he just wasting time? And some of the wasting time, it is his phone, there's a trade-off, you know? Even if I was paying for his phone, um, there's a trade-off. You, you, you be a little nice sometimes and a couple texts to the girlfriend, not all day long, um, okay, so we lost a little productivity. It's just where we are in society today. Um, it's, it's tough, it's a hard decision on that, on cell phones, it is. Don't know, but the but CNC it it gives you pacing anyway, which is something you don't get the same on current manual uh, machining. Nobody does what we used to do on manual machines, where we were we were a computer control. We were you you just you didn't mess with the guy. We did things on totally manual, not even turret lays, but on manual machines that just that piston job that I did in here. I wish, and I don't want to bother setting up to go do it, but I wish I would have had a video of us doing that because I just don't see anybody else doing that today like what we used to do. And it was common in the 70s, 80s, and even in the early 90s yet to be doing things on manual machines. You get your digital readout, you set your offsets, your quick change tools, you got them on a rack, you're rolling through stuff. It's actually pretty amazing how quick you can do it. And while that's not as quick as the CNC, you still got to balance that out. How many of these pistons are we going to make before the orders quit coming in? Do we spend $32,000 on this machine? Or do we keep making them on the manual machine and make less money per hour? It, it's... Uh, lots of variables it really is a lot of it is is financial it's not just a matter of a or b and a lot of times also we compare cnc to totally manual take a screw machine most people don't even and they make screw machines today that are computer controlled but a manual Screw machine, while it takes longer to adjust what you're doing for the screw, they make screws as fast or faster than a CNC machine screw machine does. Um, way back, they were made in the 20s, made in the 30s. The, they just spit screws out. Um, it's quick. You, you can't really just compare one thing to the other. It's not simple. There's a whole bunch of stuff out here. Um, and when I need 
a different machine. And we're in, we're, and where we really see this here is we're in Fairbanks, Alaska. We are the shop. We are the shop that does it. Um, there's a, no, a couple other shops that do things here too, but we are, we catch the stuff generally that nobody else can do. And they don't ask most of the time, while there are some people that have the idea of, oh, can you do it on, do a CNC? Most people are, do you have one that's big enough to do this? Are you capable of doing this? Can you hold this precision? And a lot of times, uh, like our one where we did the rotor uh, shaft that had a big groove worn in it, I called it a bearing retention groove. Um, we did that beyond what our capability of our machines were. We went out, we did field work also on 994 loader doing stuff that you just don't bring it to the shop. It's not just what the shop has, but what the shop personnel can envision. And uh, once, you, once you get honed in and you really have that knowledge that when you see the part, you know the perfect way to make it, and this is the best without a question, you need to go back and wake up because there's 82 other ways that other machinists have seen to make that. And guess what? A couple of them are better than what you were thinking. You got the wrong idea if you think you know it all.